Well, welcome once again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I am thrilled to be with you as we look at chapter 9 this week of um, Max Lucado's book, Traveling Light. Now, in chapter 9, uh, Lucado um, titles the chapter, Getting Over Yourself, The Burden of Arrogance. It's interesting. Um, I was thinking about that word arrogant. And when I think about the word arrogant, and I think about, for example, the word pride, and then I think about the word humility, you know, all three of those words really are related. They really are connected. Um, When you look at the Bible, or the Bible, at the dictionary, um, they are shown as synonyms or antonyms of one another. So we have similar words here, right? Synonyms. We have uh, pride, we have arrogance, and then we have an antonym, which would be kind of humility, right? So we would say pride and arrogance are on one side, humility is on the other, and they are not alike. If you are prideful, if you are arrogant, you are not humble. Um, But I want you to think for just a moment about how we actually get to the idea of being humble. Is being humble just being without pride or arrogance? I don't think so. I think there's a lot more to the idea of humility than simply pride and arrogance. So let's talk about pride and arrogance for just a moment. Pride. um, You know, pride, I think, can be a good thing in one sense. Um, For example, um, we may be proud of what our children are doing or proud of what our, our our spouse has accomplished or maybe even proud of what we have accomplished in our in our lives uh, that doesn't necessarily a, a bad thing it isn't necessarily wrong to have pride in your heart in your mind about the things that you've accomplished or the ones that you love have accomplished or to uh, have pride in the ones whom you love where pride becomes problematic of course is where what i'm going to call arrogance Arrogance is when this idea of pride, this idea of uh, feeling um, um, feeling a sense of, 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 of thankfulness or gratitude or um, awe or wonder or um, I'm not even sure what the other words would be, but, but feeling uh, this, this, this joy, this sense of joy and, and, and uh, pride. Uh, when uh, someone in our family or or even ourselves succeeds at something, it's not necessarily a bad thing. The bad part is when that pride becomes problematic for us or for other people. When our pride gets up to this level where it's now having a negative impact, either on myself or on usually on someone else, How does that happen? Well, I have seen countless situations, um, countless examples um, in the years that Sarah has been a teacher where a a, a parent um, has this, this strange kind of pride in their child that this pride that they have in their child leads them to a place of... Um, well, what Sarah and I sometimes called make-believe. They believe that their child has better attributes, uh, more skills, uh, more um, abil- abilities uh, than what the child really truly demonstrates in a classroom. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't actually have those things. They don't have those abilities and attributes and so forth, but they don't demonstrate them. And so there's, on one hand, not really a reason to have pride because Listen, little Johnny isn't quite the, the student you think that they are. But from the parents' eyes, there's this like blinding kind of pride um, that has blended over into arrogance that my child can do no wrong. You don't know my child the way I know my child. My child would never do that. Well, I think Sarah would probably tell you that as a teacher, she knows your child probably in ways that you don't know your child. And so you see what I mean? This pride thing can become this this blown out of proportion experience. And that's where arrogance kind of comes in and it becomes problematic. So we fight arrogance with something called humility. 
but what exactly is humility? I mean, is is being humble is 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 humility simply just kind of like letting everyone steamroll over you? Everybody else is right, I'm wrong. Um, having having essentially no backbone? No, no, not at all. In fact, I think Scripture would tell us if we're really truly going to be humble, we have to have quite a firm, quite 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 a quite a um, established backbone, if you will. Because it takes a lot of work to be humble. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of desire, passion for other people, for the good of other people to be humble. And this is where humility is so different from arrogance. When I'm humble, my my desire, my passion, my hope, my thoughts, my words, my actions, my everything is working for the good of my neighbor. I've shared this with you before. There is a, <clears throat> um, a writer and theologian um, uh, who ha- who who writes from the uh, the um, Anabaptist uh, point of view. His name is John Howard Yoder, and and, uh, and and he wrote a book called The Politics of Jesus. And in that book, um, the end of the book, he asks this really pivotal question that I, frankly, um, even from the, well, since the time I've read that book, I've never been able to really get this question out of my mind. It's, a, it's an incredible question. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, we asked this question, what would Jesus do? Um, Yoder, Yoder kind of answered that question a long time before that with this particular question. He says, can you imagine a world in which uh, before I had had any kind of action, before I gave a response, before I said something, did something, um, thought something, I thought about my neighbor first. I considered what is, what is that action? What is that word? What is that thought doing to my neighbor? How does it benefit my neighbor before it benefits me? Can you imagine if every person thought that way, how different this world would be? If every person said, what is this action or thought or word going to do to my neighbor before we did it, thought it, or said it? Can you imagine how different the world would be? I'll give you one example from our COVID in, uh, COVID environment we live in. Um, sadly, I still see from time to time, not too often, but from time to time, um, people in the grocery store or in the uh, post office or whatever it is who refuse to wear a mask, a face mask, a face covering. The reality of that is that there's selfishness there. There's sort of a prideful arrogance that says, I'm better than that. I don't need to do that. I, I don't, I don't, whatever it is. Um, humility would say, well, I don't really know how my actions in this moment uh, might impact my neighbor. And so for their safety and mine, the smartest thing to do is to put the mask on and wear it so that we can all be protected. There are some who don't feel that way, apparently. Imagine how different our COVID environment world would be if every single person everywhere said, what I'm about to do right now, how does that impact my neighbor? And you can begin to apply that to so many different um, places, thoughts, uh, moments in your life. What I'm about to experience, what I'm about to say, what I'm about to think, what I'm about to do, how is it impacting my neighbor? Well, the reality of that, right, is that instead of asking how is, how is it impacting my neighbor, we in this world, and, and I say we, I, I lump us in there, hopefully we're not as much a part of this, but th- the world, rather than asking about my neighbor or their neighbor, says, well, how does this benefit me? What is my benefit? How do I gain from what's about to happen? And so the actions, the thoughts, the words we say, think, and do are geared towards our gain, not our neighbors. 
Well, that's really the heart. I'm sorry, it took me 10 minutes to get there, but that's the heart really of what Lucato is writing about here. He writes at the very beginning of this chapter, uh, in chapter 71, he says, humility, or chapter nine, page 71, he says, humility is such an elusive virtue. Once you think you have it, you don't, or you wouldn't think you did. You've heard the story about the boy who received the most humble badge and had it taken away because he wore it, right? <clears throat> to be humble is not something you put on display. That's that's an oxymoron. Uh, a, a, a great display of humility is an oxymoron. If it's humility, it isn't a great display. And, and so I want to turn to page 72. The, the third paragraph, I'm sorry, the fourth paragraph on page 72 says this. This one piece of luggage God hates. He doesn't dislike arrogance. He doesn't disapprove of arrogance. He's not unfavorably disposed towards arrogance. No, God hates arrogance. He's not, I'm sorry, what a, what a meal of maggots does for our stomach, human pride does for God's. A little bit later, down at the bottom of the page, he says, God hates arrogance. He hates arrogance because we haven't done anything to be arrogant about. Think about that for just a second. We haven't done anything to be arrogant about. Sure, we've all had great accomplishments in our lives, and you should have some sense of um, of, of fondness for the things that you've done. Some sense of, of hey, that, that was a pretty cool thing that I was able to accomplish. But the reality is, were you really able to accomplish it on your own or were you able to accomplish it because God made you able, he equipped you to do that thing? And so that changes the sense of our pride over something, right? And, and so he, he writes here, page 72 at the bottom, God hates arrogance. He hates arrogance because we haven't done anything to be arrogant about. Do art critics give awards to the canvas? Is there a Pulitzer Prize for ink? Can you imagine a scalpel growing smug after a successful heart transplant? Of course not. They are only tools, so they get no credit for their accomplishments. We are tools. We are the tools that God has to use for his gospel, his kingdom, his love, his generosity, his provision. And so our sole purpose in this world, in this life, is to enable God, um, enable might be the wrong word, uh, fulfill uh, what God has already said he is doing for us, um, to do that in, in, in this earthly way. And so he, he moves us, and he, he moves our mouths, and he gives us words. And he intends that when we use those words and he moves us, we will use it for his kingdom, for his glory, for his gospel. But what arrogance does is it steps in and it says, I'd rather do it for my glory, for my own. I want to kind of summarize all of this for you because I want to get back to the idea of traveling light, dropping this luggage and getting rid of it, giving it over to God. You know, we've been working on this uh, this. This the diagram here, and, and 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 to take that that suitcase full of arrogance and get rid of it. What does it actually mean to get rid of arrogance? I got to go back to a verse that has come up so many times for me in probably the last two years. You've heard me say it probably ad nauseum now, but John three and thirty. He must become greater. I must become less. Humility is nothing more than that. That God is always greater. My neighbor is always greater. My spouse is always greater. My child is always greater. Whoever it is is always greater. The man on the street who, who's begging for coins is always greater. Others are always greater. Humility is not about steamrolling, uh, you know, somebody being able to steamroll over me. It's not being uh, floppy and weak and, 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 and limp and wimpy. It is about strength in our purpose that God has given us to think of others first before ourselves. And so I'll leave you with this thought about arrogance versus humility. You know, arrogance obviously would say, me, 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 me first, me first, me first. Um, 
some point, I believe it was in the late 50s, early 60s, um, probably late 50s for sure, um, Tennessee Ernie Ford, great uh, singer of the, of the, really the late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way into the 80s. Um, he recorded uh, on, a, on a hymns album that he had done um, this, this old southern hymn uh, that is really rare and hard to find, but it's, it's a hymn just simply called Others. And in this song, Tennessee Ernie Ford um, s uh, sings these lyrics that say, uh, May every day, in all I think and all I do, always consider others. And, and it doesn't even include that before myself part. It's just, may I consider others. I think the before myself part is sort of just understood. Because if I'm a considering someone else, why would I not place their needs, their, um, their good above my own? I think Scripture calls us to place theirs above ours. So what does it really look like to get rid of this luggage of arrogance? It really comes down to one kind of simple idea. Don't give up your strength. Don't give up your uh, God-given gifts, talents, abilities. Don't let anyone count them as cheap. Don't you ever count them as cheap. You are to be, um, to be, to be valued. You have been given gifts and strengths and abilities. And yes, they are for the good of you and for the good of others. But when given the opportunity to consider something more than yourself, something bigger than you, some, something beyond your own gain, always consider others first. That's humility. And so humility steps out of the way from myself in order to be given the opportunity to step in to someone else's life. I step out of the way of my own gain, my own good, my own life in order to step into the gain of someone else's life. I want to encourage you with that. That's the task that we need to be reminded of constantly, that we need to be trying to work towards constantly, to step into the path of someone else for their good, to make them better. That is humility. I hope you have a great week. I hope you enjoy this chapter, and I look forward to, to meeting together with you soon. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're doing this sort of real time with us, uh, today is um, Monday, December 14th. Um, we are actually going to take uh, two weeks off of this study, so there will be no uh, word for the week next week. Uh, that would be Monday the uh, 21st, or, nor will there be one the following week, which would be uh, Monday the 28th. Uh, we will resume uh, after the, the New Year's holiday, uh, and I look forward to getting together with you as we read chapter 10 then. Uh, until then, have a very Merry Christmas and a blessed holiday season, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.